Same intro as normal, I'll bring you in. Yeah, yeah, go on. Welcome back to the Pit Stop podcast. As you know, it's August, guest month. It's guest month. We've just been reading them out at the minute, haven't we? Yeah, we've got another big one today. And this is a guest, a kind of guest we've never had before. We've never had anyone that's ever done anything like what he does. No, we haven't. And we're probably, I say this about every guest that we have, but we're like genuinely probably the most excited to have you on. No disrespect to the rest of the lads. Michael, we love you. Brad, but this guy's a legend. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Callum Nicholas. Boys, what an intro. That energy, <laughs> that energy is mad. I love it. Absolutely. Wow. Thanks for having me. I'm always nervous for the intro. Like, my hands shake a little bit for the first, oh, mate, like, two you, minutes. You, the energy you brought on that one was intense, man. You've got, you've got me emotional right now. <laughs> <That's laughs> it. It's, yeah. always, it's always, like, slightly nerve-wracking in the beginning. Then it just gets really good, I feel, like, halfway through. That's pretty much what happens. And then yeah. we start chatting a load of shit, and then who knows where it may go. We do, we do. It's the thing as well. Do you just, like, build up and just practice this stuff, watching telly and... No, um, no, not mate, really, no practice. Mate, nah. No, we literally. Said, I'm just gonna do. A, you know, I'm gonna do a podcast and. Yeah, that's, mate, that's, that's literally it. That's yeah. amazing. What, well, how did it start? Didn't we turn around when we were watching it and just be like, "Let's film ourselves chatting about it." Because we we did some podcasts it. in my room, haven't we? We'd set the mics up and we were talking about all our mates and we'd predicted like the future. Yeah, I suppose that was our practice. We did like a couple trial runs because we got all the gear and everything. So we were just like, let's just chat shit. So we like... <laughs> but that was nothing to do with Formula One. That, that, that yeah, was nothing yeah, yeah. to do with Formula One. Mm. Oh, mate, it's wicked. Really, really good. Man, how are you this week? What's, what's been going on in good, the life of Callum? Know, I've, had, I've had a couple of weeks off, um, sort of recouping from the first half of the season. Yeah. Now we're back to work next week, and I just I just want to get going now. Like, what a first half of the itching. season as well, mate! What a first half! It's it's been busy, you know. It's been it's been chaotic at times, and to get the results and be in the position we're in is pretty pretty good. Yeah, just finishing before the break. Obviously, we had Brad on straight away after you know that amazing race, Verstappen coming and winning that. That was insane. Yeah, and. You mentioned straight away that you saw, didn't Verstappen run straight over and it was to you and Brad? I think it was me and it was one of the other guys with their cow and we were struggling to hold him up really. I thought, <laughs> I thought we were going down. I thought he was going to take us out. Yeah. I love that everyone knows everyone. We I know. Guess, that's the best thing about this podcast now. We can start talking yeah, about it's that. Like, it's like a little family. A little like, community. Cool. Yeah, we're going to start like, getting yeah. loads that's of inside good. stories. <laughs> I've got mean, no stories. <laughs> <laughs> We've got so many important questions to ask you, but probably the most important one that I have is... How was Disneyland? Mate, oh, yeah. di- mate Disneyland, what a place. <laughs> well, honestly, I'm knackered. I probably need another holiday. Just been chasing the little one around for like 10 days. But yeah, it was nice, man. It's probably the first first time in a while that you just forget about everything for a couple mm. of weeks and just go and do fun stuff. And Your videos were killing me when you're on the teacups and you've got dead oh, bad face. Oh, and when you're on God. the roller coaster, you've got dead bad face. Mate, I, lo- I love a roller coaster as well. Like, that was a tough one. I, was, I struggled to keep a straight face. <laughs> Struggle. <laughs> I'm a kid, like you know, you go there and there's all the rides that Bella's not tall enough to do yet. Yeah. I'm straight on there. Oh, I just, <laughs> just look after Bella for a minute. I'm gonna go. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Disney's amazing. I've been before. Let's just quickly tell the people. Do you want to explain exactly what it is you do? Yeah, at Red Bull? absolutely. Um, I am the senior power unit assembly technician at Red Bull Racing. Okay. That's, sounds very that's, serious. That's, yeah, that sounds very like intricate. What does that, well, what does that involve? Well, basically, I'm responsible for sort of making sure that all our power units and their sort of ancillary systems, so cooling systems, exhaust systems, all of the pipe work and things that integrate the power unit into the chassis, I'm sort of responsible for making sure they're serviced and they're in good working order, they're sort of well looked after, as well as all of it being built to the correct spec. Um, looking after the lifing, obviously the, the mileage that's on the parts and making sure everything's sort of ready in time for all our events. And you also are part of the pit crew. Yeah. Because Fab's noticed you changing a tyre. Yeah, what that's, that's it? Uh, it's back right, isn't it? Yeah, so, re- yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Is it well, all back yeah. right? I can't yeah, believe yeah. I've got that. <laughs> in, well fairness, done. in fairness, the giveaway is the hair hanging out the helmet. <laughs> <laughs> we look for you. <laughs> but yeah, so do the wheel gun on that uh, right and rear. Um, been doing that for a couple of years now. So your wheel gun, and so someone else will pull the wheel off, and you're there ready with it. Yeah. So you got like three. You got like three of you per corner. So obviously the car arrives, and you got to hit that nut and get the nut undone. Someone will take the wheel off. We got another bloke who'll put the wheel on, and then I've got to do up that second nut. Oh, so you, you take it off and put it back on? Like, yeah. The nut. The yeah. nut itself. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. yeah that's that's your job. Is essentially you're, you're undoing that nut and getting it back up tight so the car can go. How precise do you have to be? Because we... we yeah. Went, yeah, we did it on we the... the you know, the F1, challenge. they have the pit stop challenge thing. We yeah. did that and I, what was I doing? I was doing the, I was doing what you do. 
And yeah, you were he was the doing the wheel gun. gun. I was putting it on. And every time I was going for it, I kept missing the nut. And then yeah. the thing in my thing would fall out. Like the, I don't know what you call that. Yeah. But so yeah, you just you got you got to hit it. You know, <laughs> so, you, got, you just got to go it's, fucking. It's, it's however big. It's not. It's not. You know, a couple of you got a couple of inches. You probably got, you know, half an inch either side leeway just because of the shape of the socket. Yeah. Mm. But you you've got to hit it. You have got to be pretty square on it as well. Oh shit, that's that's pretty intense. Yeah. Well, you hit it when you got the world record. Uh, to be honest, to be fair, when we got the world record stop, I wasn't doing the wheel gun. Oh, okay. I was doing the left front wheel off at that point. Oh, so they mix you up a little bit? Well, no. So someone who was going back to a factory job in the team, the gun was his job at the time. So, And at the time, I was a reserve gunman. So it was sort of the natural progression to step Reserve in. gunman. Like people have, you know, obviously in each role, you try and have reserves in case people are injured or whatever. So, yeah, I was sort of the natural progression was to step into that role. Mm. <laughs> it's so crazy. The, what was it? One point eight two. Yeah, that's the world record. Yeah, and I don't I think, think that's I think ever that going to be season. Beaten. We did one point eight eight and one point eight nine. Wow. What's that? at what point straight after that did you realise that it was the quickest ever? You, Can you see? Do you know what? You you don't know if it's the record because you won't get the times. Like obviously, you get the time that comes up. Yeah. On the screen during the race, but then the actual you know defined time is worked out, and then the the actual listings are published. So you didn't actually know it was a world record probably until we were done like packing up around that time. We, we knew it was fast. We knew it was quick. You feel it. It's not one of those things you, we can go and look at the timings that we've got and stuff like that. Mm. But more than anything, it's feel. Yeah. You know, you know, you, you hear, you, you essentially only hear two wheel guns because you hear nut off and then and nut on. And it'll be so in sync. And then, yeah, exactly. They're so in sync. You don't hear it all. So essentially, what, it's that, as the car leaves, that's when you know. That's when you know it's quick. That's mad. That's so mad to do that in, in 1.8 seconds. Like, that's ridiculously quick. You get a trophy for that as well, don't you? Yeah, we get, we've got, we got, we got, <laughs> we got, we got, we got a few trophies. Every year we get a nice little plaque with all our photo and it tells us all the times and it's nice. It's been a few years of plaques. <laughs> They're all in my downstairs toilet. <laughs> so when, we, when, we, when we moved in, we put a downstairs toilet in our place and uh, when, we, when we started decorating it, I sort of said to Phoebe, I said to my partner, I said, yeah, I think I'm going to put all of my F1 stuff in there. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, all my, you know, my plaques and stuff like that. I've got like hats. And, and so it's become a bit of an homage to racing when you go to Love the it. at my house. Yeah, that's unreal. They've got to go somewhere. <laughs> well, Does every member of the team get a trophy? Or yeah, like, yeah, everyone yeah. gets a, like the same little, like all of the, all the pit stop crew members and stuff like that. Everyone gets the same mm. like plaque. And over the years, I've collected a few champagne bottles and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I'm sure the trophies are worth it. But what's the party like? Well, actually, what was it? What was the part, what was the part <laughs> like the when party. you won last year? Do you know what? It was it was, it was a weird one. I remember the next day because we had uh, a test. We obviously we had the young driver, the end of season test. So we were back in the garage on Monday morning after winning, and I I remember feeling fine, and I was a bit I was almost disappointed in myself. Yeah. I was like, I didn't go hard enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was in work and we were fine. We were getting the car ready, and there was obviously there was a few people who were a little bit late and whatever. But it, it was it was a good night. What does like a normal race weekend look like for you? What day do you fly out and then what do you do when you get there? So it's a bit better this year. So last year you'd expect to fly out depending on whether it was a European or sort of a flyaway race. You'd expect to sort of fly out either Monday or Tuesday. So on a European you'd fly oh out on God, a Tuesday. Oh my God, you really are gone like the yeah, whole Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd expect to fly out on a Tuesday. Um, you'd be in the garage building the car and prepping on a Wednesday. This year it's got a little bit better. We, we sort of, you try and do some, you try and move stuff around and, we, we try and fly out if we can on a Wednesday for the Europeans, depending on how well prepped you are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of days away. It's a, you know, it's a lot of days away and you just sort of get used to it. It's been so long now that it's, it's just become a part of life. You sort of schedule your life around it. It's, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that. I mean, it, like, how do you, what do you sacrifice in order to do this job? It's like, I'm really lucky I've got a partner who's super supportive and we met when we were racing, when I was at Marussia, my first job in F1. Mm -hmm. Is she involved in F1 as well? Or? No, so she, no. she at the time, she worked for the hospitality team Cool. Um, when I was at Marussia, and that's how we met. Um, I've seen loads of lovely girls in Formula One hospitality. <laughs> yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a few, there's a few. Okay, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's how we met. So she is, to, to a certain extent, she understands, you know, and at least I'm sort of in a position where I was doing it when we met, so she sort of knew that was, this was going to be a thing for us. But don't get me wrong, it's tough for her. She's super supportive. We've got a young kid. And I know that when she was really young, it was, it was tough for her. You know, so many hours when you're just essentially doing childcare, you haven't got another adult around. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, it's, it's been tough for her. For me, I'm, I, miss, I miss 
my little and I miss my partner. But to a certain extent, I you know, I love racing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, yeah. Lo I love racing. I love competing. I love being there. You know, it'd be a huge change to my whole lifestyle to not do it. Mm. Did you always want to do Formula One? Mate, not at all. Like, how's this started from the beginning? Honestly, Did you... not, not at all. Like, I, left, I left school at 18, a yeah. couple of A-levels like, that I was never really going to use and had no idea what I wanted to do at all. I knew I liked doing stuff with my hands. That was, that was all I knew about myself. So, you know, I, I resist. I didn't want to go to uni because there was nothing that I was going to study and really get stuck into yeah, it. Like it me, all yeah. I was going to do is I was just going to have a massive student loan. I would have had a great time. <laughs> like, I knew, I, and you know what? I'm, I guess I'm lucky that I was self-aware to know that if I was going to go to uni, it was only going to be to have a great yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to be there because I, I, I'd found something I loved doing. So I, I spent a little while kicking around and then a mate of mine worked at a local road car garage just around the corner from my house and he said, oh, we, we need an apprentice. And I was like, yeah, I'll do a bit of that. And you know, that apprenticeship turned into sort of a job as a mechanic and I was just getting dirty every day up to my yeah. elbows in Greece, fixing people's BMWs and whatever. Earning cash in hand, it was a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> and, I know those times. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and do you know what? It, it was only, like, whatever it was, 2008, and I actually got made redundant. The garage was really quiet and my boss just couldn't afford to keep me there. And I was sort of back to the point where at least now I knew, I knew I wanted to be a mechanic. But because I'd never studied for it, I, I knew that I was going to have to go back to college in some sort of respect to, to get the qualifications yeah. I needed. You know, whether I wanted to go and work at a main dealers or if I wanted to start my own game. I like really, I'd need some sort of official qualifications in order to go and do it. And I was lucky, a mate of mine was working in F2 at the time. And he said to me, oh, there's a, there's a college at Silverstone. It's not been there long. It had only been there a couple of years at the time I enrolled. It was the National College for Motorsport at Silverstone Circuit. It's still there now. It's grown a lot, but when I went there, they only took like 60 pupils each year. Mm. And I remember going there and talking to them and they were like, oh, because by this point I was 20, you know, by this point I was like 20, 21. They were like, ah, oh, you know, you, all of our students are like 17, you know, you'd be the oldest student we ever had. And I sort of convinced them that they needed to take me because I needed more than anything with motorsport for me was the apprenticeship opportunities. Yeah. Because I knew, you know, and it was hard because going from earning money and sort of being an adult to going back to college and being and going back to being an apprentice. It's a bit of a weird feeling. It was I a imagine. bit weird. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I was I was lucky. I had family that helped me sort of deal with it financially. And for the rest of it, I sort of winged it. I went to college and I sort of just put myself out there. So I was just harassing teams, all the junior teams at the time. They used to all go looking for apprentices from the college. You know, motorsport, it's all sort of geographically, it's all based in this sort of, middle like valley of England, the motorsport valley as we sort of call it. And so all of the teams used to go looking for apprentices at the college. Mm. And uh, I just kept putting myself out there. I sort of, I was at this point, I saw as an older student compared to the rest of my class, I was a bit of an advantage because I sort of understood life. I knew that I could go there myself. I was confident enough to go there myself, do these right. things. And one of the things that our passes from the college allowed us to do was to go into the circuit during our lunch break so with our college pass, like, because oh, obviously cool. there's always track days there. Like, yeah, every yeah. day, like, you know, it's not just massive motorsport events that happen at Silverstone. Every day of the week, there's yeah, something loads going happening on. There, yeah. And one week, I, I, I was walking around the paddock at the old garages, and uh, there were small teams all setting up for Brick Car 24. And uh, I, I, honestly, I walked up and down that paddock like three times, just asking teams, oh, you know, I'm from the college. Can I come and help you out for the weekend? Blah, blah, blah. And so many of them were just like, ah, nah, sorry, not interested. And honestly, after like an hour of walking around this paddock, this small father and son team, they were like, yeah, you can come and help us out if you want. Just, you know, there's loads of jobs I needed doing. Mm. And that was my first ever race. That's uh, unreal. That was, that, was, that was my first ever race um, as a mechanic. I slept in my car for the weekend in the circuit. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, in the circuit car park, I just laid the seat out in the old wow. golf. And I slept in, in the, the golf. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice yeah. golf. Let's go. <laughs> slept in the car for the weekend and uh, it was the best thing ever. I mean, it was, it was just a massive eye opener. I think that was for me the defining point. It sort of took to that point where I was like, this is what this I've got to do. This is what I want to do. What did they get you to do? to do? I mean, I was running tires back and forth to the Dunlop tent in the mm. rain. It was pissing down. <laughs> you didn't like, care. All weekend, didn't care. Loving it. Smile on my face, having a, <laughs> having a great time. Loving this little it, yeah. Honda Integra that we ran. And it was like, <laughs> it, was, it was mega. Greatest experience ever. And that was my first sort of motorsport reference. Yeah. So then when I went to GP3 teams and I was like, well, you know, I've, 
I've done I've done a little bit and I can turn spanners and that was and and that was the first opportunity that I'd got to show it and once I had that reference then I was be able to go to teams and say look I'm ready to go you know I'm, I'm doing the qualifications I need but I'm ready to go now yeah. you know I'm ready to go right now I'll do whatever it takes and I got a apprenticeship at a GP3 team status they're called they were running cars in GP3 at the time which is F3 now um, and I did that got a number two job mechanic number two mechanic job there um, and then it just sort of seemed to just snowball it just became the natural progression so I, I went from there I was lucky enough they took on a joint project where I got to do Le Mans so at, oh, the, same, so at the same time as doing a season of GP3 I was doing Le Mans events and learning an LMP2 car at the time which was mega like Le Mans to this day is one of the best races I've ever done yeah given, I really want to go watch that right honestly yeah, given to. the opportunity I'd do another Le Mans like tomorrow you know, it always clashes. Were you there for 24, the whole 24 hours? Mate, by the time, the first Le Mans I did, by the time the race started, I'd been awake for 30 hours. Wow. <laughs> you know, you forget like, you know, the pre-qualifying and the yeah, qualifying yeah, and yeah. the scrutineering and all the stuff you have to do. Like we'd already done an all-nighter on the car. It was a new car. It was like mm. the first time we'd like run it in anger. And yeah, it was it was chaos, but it was amazing. And I'd, I'd do it again. Le Mans as well is a place, like the whole city becomes part of the event. You know, like oh, the really? cars go into the town yeah, for yeah. the scrutineering and stuff well, like we've that. Never, never been. I'd well, love to go. Yeah, mate, you should do a Le Mans. Really, really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I got to do that at the same time as GP3, so I was sort of getting this wealth of experience all at once. Do you and say GP3 turned into yeah GP3 because GP3 and GP2, the series name just changed. They became F3 and F2. Right. I'm right. sure it's a got very complicated. So, does that mean they weren't yeah, owned? Yeah. They weren't owned by like Formula One before then? Or something Mate, like I, I don't. I have no idea. No, I, I have no idea. <laughs> All I know is that like, those series that you know the cars were the same. They just yeah. became a Fair. different, mm. different name. Yeah, I guess they just wanted uniformity. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, 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 makes, it does make sense. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so did that, and then one day got a phone call uh, from Dave O'Neill, who was the team manager at Marussia at the time just to let you know I've never even fucking heard of Marussia before Have you, do you know about Marussia? no what's yeah. Marussia? so Marussia was an F1 team that where, where I first started <laughs> that's bad as a mechanic <laughs> F1 so Marussia became what year was that? Oh, what, was it? right so Marussia went into administration in like 2014 okay um, I always remember it was just before the USGP because I was fuming that I didn't get to go to Texas oh no <laughs> But they, so they, yeah, so that- Oh, so, wait, they, so you, you would have been out of work for like a year or- you, Well, so, this whole, anyway, so I, we'll get to that, we'll get to that bit, we'll get to that bit. But I, so yeah, I got the call to go and work for this F1 team, Marussia. Uh, they're a really small team. They were based in the factory that Hass are based in now, mm. in Banbury. Um, but it was a really small team, like, you know, it was us and Caterham at the back who was gonna come 18th and who was gonna come 20th, it was. It was very much like that, but that yeah. was the stepping stone for me from doing other stuff to seeing what work in the F1 paddock Yeah, got like. into the F1 paddock, yeah. And, it, but, and for me, it was still like, okay, I look back now and think, okay, compared to what I know now as F1, we were operating in a, you know, a much lesser extent, you know, yeah, yeah. A, a, this really small under budgeted team. But for me as a 23 year old, I think I, yeah, 23, just turned 24, to be building cars in F1 paddock was like such a- That's unreal. It was such an eye. When I look back at it now, you know, I think of how quickly I managed to sort of escalate my career just mm -hmm. by just by doing whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like there was a time where you could call me up and say, Cal, can you do this? And the answer was always yes. The answer was never no. Oh yeah, I can't do that. I've got this. I'd find a way. Yeah. You know, like that was sort of my attitude to it because I felt like I was behind. I felt like I was behind, you know, like now, if I was to go back, you know, I'd want to be doing that apprenticeship when I was 16, 17, you know? So I felt like I was behind the curve. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I was trying, I was really just pushing and pushing. And uh, so I was at Marussia, yeah, obviously learned so much there. Um, and then when it came to an end, there was obviously like, you know, 200 odd people in F1 looking for F1 jobs. You know, it was like, it felt like you were in this mad scramble. You got, yeah, a lot you got, of people, if yeah. you want to stay in the sport, like for me, like there was no option. I needed to stay in the sport. 200 people just from the Marussia team. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, lot that's a lot of people. It's a lot yeah. of people. And they're you all know, you know, to find a new From one. designers and, you know, for, throughout the whole of a team. It's mm. a lot of people that are now out there chasing yeah. F1 jobs. And there, there aren't, there aren't that many if you want to, if you want to walk into, you know, a job from one team to another. They're not, 
frequent, you know, like they're not, it's not like every other week there's a new mechanics job advertised. It's not like that, mm. you know, and it's certain times in the year. So luckily going into December was probably the best time for me to be looking for a job. But I sent my CV out to every team, <laughs> every team. I just sent my CV out and loads of them replied. Loads of them said, look, we haven't got any jobs, but we'll keep your CV on file. Um, a couple of them I, I interviewed at Ferrari, Ferrari were mega actually. They flew me out to the, for the day and I visited their factory and I, I interviewed wow. there. That's cool. And, 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 you know, ultimately, I think we all knew that I didn't want to live in Italy. I wasn't ready to leave London and I wasn't ready to leave England. But they, they were a mega. They were really accommodating and they sort of helped me understand what I'd need. And, yeah. Mm, yeah. And then I, got, I, remember, <clears throat> I remember getting that call from, from Red Bull um, to go to the first interview. That was like the beginning of December. Um, and I went to that interview and... I just remember being so nervous. I remember driving into this factory, <laughs> like from what I understood as F1, you know, I drove into this factory and I was just, I remember driving into the campus and just being like, wow, this is F1. Wow. You know, it's gone from one small, nice, nice looking building to like all these buildings and the, all the Red Bull signposts everywhere and all these cars in the car park. And you're like, wow, all these people are here racing. Mm. You know, it was a massive eye opener, the, the change from going from a sort of team that was like maybe 200 people to a team that was like 700 people yeah. or whatever it was at the time Shit. when I started. So what year was this? So that was January 2015. Right. So I got, I remember getting the call just before Christmas of 2014 to say, look, we want to offer you this job. That's I don't so think, I, don't so think I, I, I can't remember who it was, but I can't, I don't think they got to finish their sentence. I was just like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll be there, I'll be there tomorrow. No, 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 you don't start till January. Ledge. Wow. Was that was Red Bull like the the fucking giant team that they are now back in 2015? Were they like the? Hadn't one? they just won? I thought they won three in a year then. Yeah, three so obviously like 20 up to 2013 they'd won four in a row. Oh yeah, so that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still, you know, it was this huge team, you know, and it was it was I don't know it was it was a bit of a bit of an eye opener. I thought I'd been doing F1 for a couple of years already. Nah, and I was like, nah. <laughs> yeah, this, exactly. It was like yeah. this is something completely different. Who is like your boss? Like, who is your boss, Christian? Uh, Christian's everyone's boss, isn't he? So yeah, but do you know what I mean? Like, when someone hires you, who's the per is there someone? So at the time, so at the time when I first went to my interview, it was with our support team uh, chief, uh, chief mechanic, our support team manager. And then when I got to the interview, our race team, like one of the race team mechanics had decided that they wanted to join the interview as well and the head of our car build. So it ended up like an interview with me and three of these guys at oh, Red Bull. No. I would have been shit. Man, I was, <laughs> honestly, I was. I, was. <laughs> I absolutely was. What was the interview like? Did you just say car, car build? You had to build a fucking car in the No, interview? as in like, so, you know, they, they were the managers from those departments. I was interviewing for a factory role. So it was as a factory, oh, a factory oh, okay. mechanic. So it was like preparing chassis doing, you know, sub-assembly work, but for the race team, right. essentially, race team prep work in the factory. That was the job I'd interviewed for. Um, and I started there. I, I started there, and then, like, a week after, people moved around, and I ended up being able to go over to our support team. So, like, our support team do, obviously, our, all the show events, all those Red Bull show events you see where you get like, fans get to go up and close and do donuts in cool places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I did that for like a, a year. So my first year at Red Bull, that was that was what I was doing. It was mega. It's cool, man. Like the fan interaction, stuff like that. It's a little bit less intense as well, but you, you still get to learn how everything's working. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. But it's sort of a nice way to sort of lead into, because it's, again, you know, I've been racing, I've been in the pit lane, I've done pit stops at this smaller team at the back of the grid. And now, you know, you've got to perform an even higher level, essentially, the same level, a higher level, and it really, is, it matters to a lot of people, and it doesn't just matter to yeah. you anymore. Like before, it was, you, you felt like you were doing your great job because you're proud of what you did. Yeah. Now, you, you're proud of what you do, and also a lot of people are gonna wanna know how you're getting on. And the consequences are, <laughs> and the consequences, are a lot worse yeah. if you The consequences, yeah. you know, the stakes are so much higher. Yeah. You know, like I remember Damn. my first pit stop when I was at Marasha, I remember doing the, the, the right front wheel gun. And it was the first live stop that I'd ever done in a pit lane. And it was a lot harder, the wheel gun at the time, because at the time on the Marussia car, the nuts weren't retained in the wheel. So you know, like now, like all the teams, like the nuts stay in the wheel, they're like retained. Right. So each wheel has its own nut. But with the Marussia, the nut wasn't. The nut like came off with the gun and you had to make sure that it stayed on the gun until that's you. exactly what happened that's, that's that what was, was with yeah, us like you say doing the pit stop I couldn't hold it so in that's what, so that's what, it, that's what it used to be like that's what it used to Mate, be like no like, way yeah and you'd be like trying to sort of as you gunned it off you'd be trying to like slow the socket down 
so that it wouldn't just spin yeah. off like it had magnets on it but you're racing you're trying to, you're that's, trying to go that's ridiculous man that's yeah, so, so much it was, pressure it was way it? harder and i remember like after that pit stop i always remember it was brazil um, which at the time was like the last race of the season and uh, I remember afterwards, for like the whole race after that pit stop, I was just there and I was shaking, man. I was still like the <laughs> adrenaline, the adrenaline was flowing, you know. And now I look at going out on pit stops and I feel like I just go through my routine and it's calm and collected. It's amazing like how, how much it's changed for you in terms of mentality. Mm. So like you don't feel as much pressure now like when you do a pit stop? I, the, the pressure's the same. Mm. It's just how you how you react to it, I guess. How you like, handle it, yeah. Whereas it's, it's a lot easier for me now to block out everything else because that's what you've got to do. Yeah. You know, on a race weekend, you're so busy all, all week, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all the way up to Sunday morning, you know, you've got all of the stuff that you're doing for your job and the car and the other stuff, you know, the, all the prep work, the stuff you're thinking about for the next event. You've got all that going on all weekend. And then you go to the grid and that's sort of the time where you're getting, for me, like everyone always says, you never smile on the grid. It's because race face you know like yeah, i'm just focused face. now mm. like my job's to get this car off on the formation lap get back to the garage and then you get back to the garage and then my only focus is getting in that routine for pit stops and you have to just block everything out and who were the drivers when you were at red bull when you went there straight away when i first started it was ricardo and kvyat oh sick Sick. So you know Ricardo quite well. Yeah, yeah, Dan, yeah. Dan, I know Dan quite Leg, well. Legend. Yeah. Seems to be. We, we share him. we share music tips every now and again. I'll say, have you listened to his album? And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you listened to this? Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I always wanted to ask that. Do you guys have like a playlist or something which gets yeah. you hyped up before the race? I, do you know what? <laughs> so I think like. The garage is sort of known for having this massive sound sound system. Like people always hear it in the pit. Well, lane. the Red Bull one. The Red Bull yeah, one, yeah. in particular. <laughs> like it's, 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 it's loud. Like you know, the neighbours have complained before. Really? Like it's, <laughs> who's your neighbour? Mercedes. Well, it, obviously it changes year to year. At the yeah. moment we got Mercedes on one side, Ferrari on the other side. Everyone's mm. quite chill. But I think there was a year when we were next door to McLaren and they weren't overly enamoured with our music. <laughs> at times. For me, it, like, oh, do you know what? The boys are going to hate this, but I can't stand all the house music. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we're with you. We're oh, with you. mate, it just does me in, like, hours and hours, and it feels like you've had the same song on in the yeah, game. Yeah, 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 I wouldn't want that one It's just hours. the same kick and snare. Oh, and mate, it just does me in. It just does me in constantly. <laughs> but it's hard, you know, you've got that many people in the garage, you're never going to please everyone. Yeah. No. Yeah, so do you have quite a good relationship with the drivers then? Do you have to work with them a lot, or is your job, do you stay away from them, yeah, kind of thing? Or does it just happen? depends on the driver. Because it you seems know? like you have a really good relationship with Max. Mate, the, Max is so sound. Like, he'll come around, he'll talk to you. You just, you know, you talk like two colleagues would in any situation. There's no, like, pretense. There's no, there's no bullshit. It's, mm. you know, everyone's there to just do a job. He knows that, you know that. You can laugh about stuff outside of work as well, you know. It's, it's a really, like, normal, mutual yeah. sort mm -hmm. of relationship. And it's, it's been the same. It was always the same with Ricardo. He was... He's a friendly guy, you know, it's, it's the same thing. He come in the he come in, in the garage, morning cans. You know, like, that's, that's that's how it goes. It's always been it's always been that kind of relationship, you know. It's in and it's been the same with most of the drivers. I think the atmosphere in the garage as a whole sort of makes it like that. Mm. Yeah. You know, we're all like we are a friendly bunch. We are we're social, you know, we're competitors, we're we're fierce when we need to be, but we're also like we get along you know we're a family we we have a laugh it's definitely really why we really wanted to get you on because we've obviously had performance coaches and it's interesting like you say it this is the glue that holds formula on together that you don't always get to see but red bull in well, especially now more than ever everything at red bull seems so in sync like when we watch you on tv just how quick everything is and yeah. we always say like barely any mistakes like yeah, it's like watching like a synchronized ballet just thing. everything <laughs> you know what I mean? like all you guys are like ro not robots but you all just work like that yeah so. like we you know we, we we've gelled like as a unit in the garage i feel like the the atmosphere in general is everybody has to gel yeah you know you have to know each other like it's not it's not just like a colleague relationship like we we, we you might laugh and we joke to each other and say oh there's no friends in motorsport but it's a lie you know, there are, there are lots of friends in motorsport. You know, you, you, you get along with people. You live together. You spend so much time. You with live them, together. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's one of the things that I think the fans don't see enough of. You know, when I look and I sort of, man, honestly, like social media at the moment and sort of the atmosphere among fans in F1 is so aggressive yeah. at the moment. You know, and it's not like that for us. It's mm. not like that for us with other teams. You know, we all live in the same spaces. You know, we take the same flights, we share hotels, we see each other in restaurants and bars, you know, and regardless of the fact that we're competitors, you know, some of my oldest friends in the paddock work at Ferrari. You know, we, we're friends, we get along, and I think maybe the fans need to see a bit more of that. 
Yeah. That's what that's what I was always thinking. There's photos like um you see all you guys sort of mixing on planes and that and you're all but you're all just having a laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we notice it in the paddock. Yeah. We've been so lucky to get into the paddock three times now. <laughs> I don't know how we <laughs> like, it. They keep letting you in. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Somehow. Well, they don't. They actually don't. We just <laughs> fucking sneak in. But anyway, yeah. No, we've noticed that everyone's just like chill throughout the whole thing. Brad yeah. was saying last year, at the end of last year, there was a like a bit of tension between you guys and Mercedes. I th- do you know what? I think last year, with the way it was, like for me, last year was so hard mentally. Mm. Like it's... Physically, it's, it's a tough, they're all tough seasons now and they're only going to get tougher physically. But I think mentally for me, the back half of last year, I felt like we were just being hunted week on week. You know, week yeah. on week, they're closing this gap and things aren't going right for us. And you felt like you were being hunted and you're just constantly yeah. just trying to stay ahead and stay ahead. And it was, it was tough, you know. It's the first time in all my time in the paddock where I struggled to sort of wind down from it. Mm. you know like normally like you can have a bad day you know it's a bad day and you're going to wake up the next day and you're going to fix it you know last year there were times where it was just so tough like even on your days off you know like the day off you get between a double header or even the week off you get at home last year like I was it was a real struggle to wind down and try and actually rest and get you know you just yeah it was so intense you just yeah, like, right, just need to get back to it just need to fix it were you yeah. part of the team that did that um, crazy change on the grid for Verstappen when it was like the suspension and they did no, it I wasn't the on the I wasn't on Verstappen's crew that year. So, I, so oh, okay. at the moment, the way it is, I build the power units assemblies for both cars. Yeah, you know, so I look after that stuff for both cars in the garage. This year, I'm on Max's car. Last season, I was on Checo's car. Um, so that was that was Max's car crew at the time. Um, a lot of those boys are still on that crew, and the the job they did was. Phenomenal. That was absolutely was it 20, ridiculous. 20 minutes it was, to get it for Yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. I think, you know, there was one of those days where I think, and that's, I look at us as a, as a crew of mechanics, and I think that's, that's one of those days where it proves you're the best. Mm. Yeah. You know? It's definitely my favourite thing about this podcast, the fact we can get these stories, because a lot of the time we would never know, because like, <laughs> there just isn't enough coverage on the stuff that goes on behind. Yeah, yeah. But obviously Drive Survivors filming every, or everything now and is everywhere. How have you seen Drive Survive change the sport? I mean, I think the, the numbers. The numbers, yeah, The numbers yeah. are undeniable, aren't they? I think, you know, they brought a whole new demographic of fans, a lot younger fan base to the sport. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's been obviously good. Yeah. You know, like we, we all want to see more fans love what we love. Um, it might in some ways have changed sort of the atmosphere around the paddock and certainly outside like you know when I look at fans engaging with one another like it's certainly the Netflix has had an effect that people might not have expected Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part I think it's been brilliant yeah do you feel like there's more eyes on you I think the first season actually do you know what the first season when we were told obviously right they're doing this series there's going to be extra camera crews and sound crews in the garage. Watch what you say. <laughs> no, do you know what? There was never that. Do you know what? There was never that. Watch what you say. Really? Yeah, we don't say anything that bad. Like you know, the audience. I guarantee you, I'd be fucked. I'm with sure. One day I'm sure. In the I'm garage sure if you get one of the sound men on here from the Netflix crew, that should be one of your guests. I'm sure they have some oh, great stories. Oh, we're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah, I'm sure they'll have some great stories of stuff they've heard. But we were we were always quite good at. If you spotted one, pointing it out to everyone. To everyone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I've been doing. I've been doing something recently where anytime I see one of these guys, because they're they're like we, you know, they're they're in the garage, and you end up getting to know them. But anytime I see one of those mics like hovering above, I just try and make it funny. <laughs> yeah. or, or, or you just try and get something out of it. Like, yeah, those rebel guys, they all need a pay rise, they do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you, just, you just drop gems like yeah, that, like anything yeah, yeah. you can. Because yeah, you see yeah. the big boom mic above the head, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so you know so, but you're... sometimes they're sneaky. Like, they'll come over the banners and stuff like that. Oh, from yeah, behind yeah. you or something, yeah. yeah. That's jokes. <laughs> no, you're definitely, I think you, in particular, you get like a lot of coverage on TV. Because I remember seeing you in the garage. And you stand out, man, because it's the fucking hair. Like, is that what it is? And I remember saying I've got to, to Jake, keep my hair, or I disappear. No, you do. It's like it's like your thing now. I remember saying to Jake, like that's a bad motherfucker. His hair's so cool. Yeah, you need to that. get him on the pod. That's exactly what he said. That and is... now we pulled you off the TV, and now you're on the same. <laughs> it's a nightmare, to be honest. Like now, it's getting so long. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. 
putting a helmet on is it hard no I just I just been going up helmet sites oh, okay. like, oh really? before the hair I was wearing like a medium helmet now it's a double XL so. yeah <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> no yeah it's so funny when we were on TV we were going to try and set you set you something to do or say so we could relate it back <laughs> I don't know next time the camera's on you when they're on TV just do any kind of hand signals <laughs> so we know they're in uh, yeah, yeah yeah I'll just write like follow pit stop on your hand <laughs> the, wor- the worst is when like you, you don't realise the camera's on you and then you look at the telly and it's you and you're like oh my god I hope I wasn't doing anything look away <laughs> yeah. I hope I wasn't doing I wasn't picking my nose was I oh, yeah because you definitely forget they're on you if you're in the moment yeah doing yeah something like, like, like you know you'll be working you're looking, on the, you're looking at the car or whatever just before a session you don't realise it's on you and, and there's like there's like this like it's almost like 10 second delay yeah or whatever so you don't realise until you look up at the telly and by that point it's too late <laughs> oh you do like the broadcast like in the garage of, of what they're yeah, filming yeah it's yeah it's still delayed from like when they film it to yeah, when yeah, we yeah. see it in the garage so that's jokes the thing that we've noticed about being at a race is like a completely different atmosphere to watching it at home but you don't you kind of lose your bearings a little bit as a fan yeah. or whatever it's kind of hard to know what's going on because you can't see all the camera angles everything that they're doing so do you watch the race back when you get home if we've had a good weekend i'll watch the highlights yeah had a bad weekend i just i just leave I don't it. want to watch it again <laughs> <laughs> i've had to yeah. sit through it once yeah 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 but that being, was a, it's like what you say about being in the paddock though like i guess some tracks are better than others like depending on where your viewpoint is mm. some tracks you can see quite a lot like there's some good viewpoints in hungary where you can see we were just mad unlucky yeah. in uh, where was it imola because of where we were in that tower we were in the marlborough tower yeah, oh, yeah. which, right was, which was amazing like it, it was great because we had an amazing view but there was no screen facing us we had oh, no so wi-fi we, so you had no idea and no what, 3g yeah. <laughs> yeah that was literally it the only way we knew who was winning the race was who came past in front of us we didn't oh, know anything yeah. going on in the but whole but then you race. could see that because the the end of the pits is right by the tower so you can see all the drivers as they line oh, up yeah they were right oh, at nice. the end of the pits yeah that was, that was really cool, cool. Yeah. so what other ones have you done you've done imola barcelona silverstone yeah. and the next one is dutch grand prix Oh, nice. Which mm. we're so excited for. Oh, I'm so excited. I bet you're going to be fucking Man, buzzing I for love, that. <laughs> honestly, Zandvoort last year, it set like a new bar. Every, every guest has said that. For Everyone has said for it's me, amazing. For like, me, like, we go to some wicked places and there's some great atmospheres. You know, Texas, Mexico, like, there's, some, there's some great atmospheres. Mm. But for me, the whole way they just sort of had the crowd going all week at Zandvoort, like they set a new bar for me in yeah. terms of atmosphere. Walking in, in and out of the circuit, it was... It was intense. Even Michael said that, didn't he? Mm. And he's not even part of Red Bull. No. Right? I imagine that. Yeah, but he was wearing orange, so he thought that they were. <laughs> That's it. He thought they were showing up for him. <laughs> Michael's here. <laughs> That's a joke. It's nice to hear that you have that um, like friendly group in the paddock because you do all have to be so in sync, trust each other, like yeah, yeah. have the have the relationships. One of the questions I had is like, if something goes wrong, well, maybe we'll put it on you first. Have you ever done anything that has gone wrong? That has led to something happening in a not, race. Not, not in F1. In F1, I, I can't think I've ever made like a mistake where it's really cost us. Like I've never, I don't think I've ever made a mistake where like we've lost the race because of it, or you know we've we've DNF because of it. Um, I've, plenty of mistakes have been made over the course really? of my mm. ten year career. Plenty. Mm. You know, like you are working to such high standards, you know, all the time, and over any period of time there's no there's no one in that paddock who's never made a mistake whether they've admitted it or not is up to them mm. yeah but i can tell you like i always have a thing if you, f- you just put your hand up you know things are going to go wrong i've made some mistakes that i've got away with plenty you know, <laughs> plenty but, but no one knows to this day no no to be honest you know as long as it goes fine you can tell people afterwards you know like yeah. it's, it's one of those it's one of those things like we've had some wild weekends the one that's always stuck out to me was uh actually danny rick in was it China 2018? I think China. I think it was like 2018 where we had an engine fail um, in P3, so like just before quality. And then, so obviously, by the time you've got the car back, you need to get it apart, swap engines. You're already like up against it time-wise to get yeah. the car out for quality. And the spare engine, for various reasons, was not prepared. It wasn't ready in the way we we, we would have wanted it to mm-hmm. be. So we were just up against it and the whole time you're just there, you're looking at, we have like a little countdown at the back to the time to the session. And the whole time I remember looking looking at that clock and thinking, oh, well, we might not get this car out. We might not get this car out. But anyway, we did get the car out, but whilst we were just finishing the car off, we were just putting like the tailpipes on at the top and we had like so many people, like obviously that's the, one of those situations where both car crews will come over, like the other car crew will come over bolt anything on that you can to just get this car out the door. That's just all you need. You just need to get the car out the door yeah. for the first quality session. And 
we were right we were right near the end and I was bolting some tailpipes on and because of the mass of people someone just like knocked me and I dropped a quarter inch spanner straight down the back of the car so, oh. so it's like Oh, no. <laughs> so it's like between the like it's like in somewhere like between the sort of engine and gearbox there's a spanner in there and and i remember like oh well we haven't got time you can't take the gearbox off to get it <laughs> we haven't got time we're just gonna have to get it out for quali and the car went out for quali with a fucking with a spanner in there <laughs> with, with, a, with a spanner in there this is I, amazing. i'd dropped in there <laughs> and I, I as soon as the car went out the door i just went to the chief mechanic and i say look i feel I've, I've dropped this spanner down the back, I said, we couldn't get it out in time. We had to just, and he was like, yeah, okay, fine. It is what it is. You know, you had to send the car. Anyway, got through quali. Ricardo ended up, I think he qualified P6. Um, and we were all just like so relieved. Like the car's got through quali, it's yeah. sweet. And obviously the whole time I'm just thinking about, there's a spanner in there. <laughs> yeah. There's a spanner in that car and I need to get it out. But obviously once you've started quali, the car's in Park Ferme. And at the time, like the FIA will let you do certain things in Park Ferme. So if you need to inspect something for reliability or whatever, you, you ask permission and they come back to you and they say, okay, we'll let you do that. Yeah. Sometimes they'll say, we'll let you do it and we'll supervise. Or sometimes they'll just say, we've got the scrutineer there to just watch you do it, whatever. So I was hoping that we'd be able to pull the gearbox off to do this and to, to inspect the back of it and get this spanner out. And I thought, oh, that's fine, it's got through quality. I'll get the spanner out later. Everything will be fine. <laughs> so we get to the garage. Gar <laughs> no, I don't, I don't feel like everything was fine. I'm so loving got, these exclusive <laughs> stories, man. We get to the garage on Sunday morning and I remember going to Phil straight away in the morning. He's like, right, we can have this box off to, uh, to get this spanner. And they're like, nah, we're going to have to leave the box on it. We're, you know, the FIA aren't going to just let us take it off for that. I was like, are you kidding me? So then we sat there during this race and Ricardo's starting P6 and so far everything's fine plotting around and then for a late safety car or whatever and we, we managed to get both cars in the box and double stop and now we're one two you know we're, we're beating mercedes in it in, yeah. in a race where really you know their car was so superior we were not expecting to be yeah must have been the spanner to be up well we're not expecting to be up there <laughs> and obviously everyone's everyone's nervous anyway like you know it was the renault days so you never know when something was might go wrong but I was just sat there this whole time just thinking any minute now that spanner is going to ruin everyone's day oh, and it's going to be my fault and I just remember sitting there and it was like the last couple of laps and everyone else is getting ready to go and celebrate on the pit wall and I'm just sat there looking, at, the looking at the chief mechanic and we're, both, we're not saying anything but we both know what we mean <laughs> we both know what we mean as we're looking at each other and I remember the car crossing the line and just being so relieved. Like I wasn't, it, was, it took me a while to be happy about the result. Yeah, because I imagine it was just, it was just relief. And uh, getting the car back in the garage, start stripping it as you do on a Sunday night. And there's the spanner, just sat there. Wow. Just sat there and it's done quali and it's done the race and it's won. And there's just like a tiny little mark on it. The spanner's fine. And the best thing is it, it wasn't actually my spanner. I borrowed it during our shit fight to get the car built. I just grabbed it out of one of the other mechanic's tool trays uh -huh. and then dropped his spanner down there. So Did it have his he, name on it? Well, it was engraved with his name anyway, but now it's got this little witness mark from where it's won a race and it's still in his... It's a famous it's spanner. Still in, That's led. Yeah, I would it's have still that in on his show. Kit. He's still got the spanner. It's still there. It's one of his... That's sick. ...most proudest possessions. Wow. Mad. <laughs> the, the gearbox is that black thing at, right at the back of the car, right? Yeah, so it's essentially the, the rear part of... The, the chassis, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember you can hear like Brundle will say on the TV, like, oh, he's right up his gearbox now. But <laughs> in my golf, I imagine the gearbox is at the, <laughs> at the front, no? Yeah, yeah. So like the chassis, knew. the engine makes up the middle bit, and then yeah. the gearbox is essentially where all your rear suspension attaches to. Right. And you had a golf before as well? I've had two golfs. So you know your way around a golf? I know my way around a golf. I had okay. an old VR6 that I loved. I had, they're they're, they're, they're decent cars. I had they? a Mulberry VR6, had that for a lot of years. And then I've got in the garage at the minute, it's sawn at the minute, but I've got an R32. Mm. So okay. I replaced the VR6 with the Mark IV R32. So it's sitting there appreciating at the moment. I need, <laughs> I need a wash, but other than that, it's just... It's good, it's good that you know your way around a golf. Well, oh, really? It is good. I feel like this is a leading question. <laughs> yeah, it's really good, yeah, actually, I'm because we, to this. We, had a, we had a bit of an idea, didn't we? It's only a little idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you do hold, hold the record for, like, fastest, like, pit, right? <laughs> Let me guess, you got a puncture right now. The world's... <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> we can give it a puncture. <laughs> Basically, we want you to change the wheel on my car and we're going to time it and see how quick you can do it. Mate, that's, that's a whole different <laughs> kettle of fish. <laughs> wow, what are we talking about? The whole time to jack it up? You got I'm in my fish. nice clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be poor about it. <laughs> you want to see how quickly I can change the wheel on your golf? Well, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah, that was the a question. A world record pit crew holder. Does it need to have all of the nuts on it when it's finished? <laughs> yeah, I need to be able to drive away. <laughs> you need to be sat in it ready wow. to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite long, isn't it? <laughs> it's not going to be two seconds. <laughs> that's right, we can edit much. it. Yeah, yeah, we can make it look that way. And we'll have a timer in the bottom corner. Yeah, yeah, we, we had to ask you on the pod. I'll, otherwise I'll you... apply to Guinness and see if that's a record. There's probably a record out there for this. Well, let's, try, let's figure out what it is after the pod and try and beat it. If How? there is, well, let's just and, we set fi- it. and we make a world record today, really? that would be unbelievable. Oh, let's just see what happens. We can do it after the pod. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have a look. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm confident I'm going to achieve this record. <laughs> Man, those wheels are heavy. Those yeah, they are. are. Have you, when was the last time you changed the wheel on your motor? Yeah, they're, I changed not... it a while back. It's, yeah. it's long. <laughs> they're not they're not easy. Easy. So yeah, I've got one of those, like, you know, thin ones. Well, so you put, that's all right. That won't be as heavy. Yeah. Can I take your one off and put a space saver on? That would be quicker. What does that mean? Oh, the, what, oh, the, yeah. the spare. Like yeah, the, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that would yeah. be easier. Yeah, but Jake's going to help out, so he'll be able to hand you the wheel. Yeah. Oh, really? I can be oh, there yeah. for speed Oh, we're going to get a whole crew. So yeah, it's yeah. not an individual yeah. record now. That's <laughs> a team effort. Yeah. And, it, and it starts as soon as I pull up. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a lap around the garage. We've got the plan this down the jacking it up's going to take, like, a couple of minutes. Yeah, we're going to have to speed that bit up. And then I, I'm going to be sat in the car the whole time you do it. Mate, it's a long, it's, it's, it's a long time since I've like properly worked on road cars as well. <laughs> like I sent my car to Audi. I said to yeah, you, like, yeah, when you we were, were organising yeah. this, I sent my car to Audi this week. Yeah, you told me to send this car to Audi. I was thinking, did I fix his own fucking car? No, <laughs> no, no, no He does it for a job, man. No like, like someone else would do it. Honestly, the F1 car's way easier to build than that thing. Really? Oh, like, there's no space on these road cars anymore. Like it's loads of plastic to get off first. And then anything you do need to do, you've got to plug your laptop into it. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's not just nuts and bolts on those things anymore. So it's, I try not to do it. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> Audi were doing the job for free. Shout out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, shout out Audi for that. Yeah, yeah for doing a job. Legend. Actually, wait, we're waiting to see. I've only driven it for a day. Let's see if it's all right. For us. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have a look at that after the pod, see if there's something we can do. But yeah, how, how many years have you been at Red Bull again now? So I've been at Red Bull for eight years. This is my eighth year. And um, is there a standout moment or story or something from the whole time there that, you're, that summarizes your... Look, winning the championship... This last, last year. year was one of my milestones when I first got into F1. You know, like you, everyone has their bucket list when they embark on this kind of stuff. And, you know, doing your first pit stop, obviously going on to break world records, all of these things were sort of landmark things. And so many of them, for me, almost all of them have been at Red Bull, mm-hmm. you know? So that there, there have been so many, you know, winning a championship last year was one of those huge moments. Um, it, I remember saying at the time, it took a little while to, to sort of sink in. You know, I mean, the race being what it was and as dramatic as it was anyway, was was quite something. But just when you, like even by the time I got home, got home and sat on the sofa and the season was done and sort of sat there and be like, won a world championship last yeah, week. Yeah, that's so cool, yeah. man. You know, yeah. like, so that's that's one of the things. And those those kind of things, they sort of stand out more to me now, you know, like now my little girl, getting home and saying, Daddy, you're world champion. Oh. Stuff like that. Those were sort of all huge things. You know, I'm really lucky all of those things have happened to me since I've been yeah. at Red Bull. I suppose you've got to try and keep a level head at, in the time and not let it get you too much. Yeah. I don't know. And then there's other things. That, you know, there's been loads of things this year. Like So like lo- last year, there was that, regardless of how stressful it was while it was going on, at the end, the sort of feeling of having achieved one of your goals was massive. Mm. And then sort of things this year that, have sort of taken me a little bit by surprise, stuff I haven't necessarily expected. So obviously, as we spoke about with, with Netflix increasing the sort of fan base of the sport and me being quite noticeable on the telly, I've, I've had so many messages this year from people messaging me saying, seeing you do what you do has inspired me to take up a career in motorsport. Wow. Or a career in engineering, or you know, you've helped me make decisions that make me want to do what you do mm-hmm. and that's it's an it's an achievement that I didn't you know expect it wasn't something that I'd ever thought yeah. oh yeah I want to be this guy that inspires people but when it happens it's it's massively humbling you know and I try and give advice to people when they ask you know I do my best to sort of tell people how I achieved it 
but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite humbling, you know, I don't, I don't take it for granted. So that's, it's one of the huge things that's sort of been happening. Yeah. That's nice hearing that from you because like we, we kind of feel the same way with what we do. No one really has sort of done what we do to an extent. Yeah. Mate. And we get these messages come through, man, and people are like, oh, we love listening to your pod. Like I've had a shit week and I put your pod on and I just, it makes me feel so much better. Yeah. And that is the most important shit to us. Mate, like when you boys first got in touch um, and I watched a load of your podcast episodes, and straight away, it sort of stuck out to me that this is something that the sport really needed. Like, you guys have absolutely killed it. This is something Thank the sport you. really needed. It's two people who themselves are still learning the sport. You know, there's, there's just, you know, people sitting around and having a chat about something they love. I think there was, a, there was this huge space for it, and you guys have done an amazing job. It's so cool as well to hear you say that, because the way you look at the end of last year, and you're like, it was so special last season, how crazy it was. That was the end of last season that got us into Formula One. Yeah. So the fact that you were there and won the championship and we were here falling in love with the sport and now we have this show and we've got you from the TV yeah. to here. Mm. It just shows that like anything's possible. And that's what we love with having people like you on as well because you just told a whole story about how you got into Red Bull. There'd be people listening that probably would dream to work in Formula One or would love to work with any form of motorsport. And I felt even... I had no idea how someone would have done it. If we hadn't have had like the guests on we've had to talk about their story, it would be very hard for people to know how people have got. So yeah. it's just given, given that platform for people to talk about, I think is really great. This yeah. is it. And I think, you know, the sport is trying to sort of make these opportunities a little bit more accessible. And I, obviously I, I, did a, I did a case study um, for the Hamilton Commission when they were first sort of looking into the diversity of the paddock and the people in motorsport as mm. a whole. And it became clear that although these opportunities are there, a lot of the time they're just not advertised. Mm -hmm. You know, people, you know, sometimes you just need someone to tell you where to start. Yeah. You know, where to start. And, you know, the more stories that people hear about the different routes people have taken, we are, I think naturally we're going to attract a wider audience. What would you say is the number one thing someone has to do if they want to start now? Like if someone was listening and they were like, I want to work for Red Bull. You, you need to go and find what motorsport is near you for a start. You know, and like, I know we, everyone thinks, oh yeah, I want to work in F1. No one starts yeah. working in F1. Like you, you're not going to just get- You need like, the references. You, you need can be the, the best mechanic. You can be the best mechanic in the world. Mm. You are not going to walk into an F1 team, get a number one mechanic job and off you go. It's just, it doesn't happen. It's not, that's not the, how the industry works. You know, yeah, yeah, all yeah. of us, there's no one in that garage that I work with that hasn't started off doing junior formulas or Le Mans or, you know, BTCC, stuff like that. All of these are the steps that we've all taken to get there. And, and the way to start is just find what's near you. It doesn't matter if it's lawnmower racing, you know, like chariot racing. Anything, like, yeah. It yeah. doesn't matter. Red Bull soapbox. It, yeah, mate, this is <laughs> There'll the be thing. someone there that knows someone that knows someone. But not that even, got just, just out. the experience of oh, yeah. competing at racing. You know, like for me, that was the, the eye opener for me was doing that brick car. I didn't care that I was sleeping in my car. You know, I didn't care. I was experiencing what it's like to compete at racing. And that was the spark that then drove me to do the next bit. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think the best advice I offer anyone is to find what motorsports around you, knock on their door and say, can I come and help you for a weekend? You know, just food and water. Can I come and help you this weekend? Have you got a test day over at Brands Hatch? Whatever it is, you know, phone your local circuit, whatever circuit's nearest to you. Phone them, ask them what sort of test days, what they're expecting. Are there going to be teams there? And rock up. You can rock up to a paddock and just say, look, I'm, I just want to go and walk around to the teams. And, mm. you, you know, if you have to pay a fiver to get into the paddock to go and see stuff or whatever, you, you're not going to be able to walk into big motorsport events. But these open test days, all of these teams, like when I was doing GP3, we had like test mule cars that we'd take to places like Spa with drivers that were interested in driving. And we were still there as a motorsport team. It just wasn't an official event, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's always going to be opportunities to try and find someone that might say, yeah, do you want to come and help out? We just need help, you know, doing tires or whatever it is. That's where you've got to start for me. Yeah, stepping you, stones. You it? know, if, if you're not going to take the university and degree route, then the hands-on experience is just as valuable mm -hmm. to you. Like the, all, of all the mechanics I work with in the garage, I think one of them has a degree and it's nothing to do with motorsport. But every single one of them has a wealth of experience of working on race cars. You know, you can you can be an expert without a degree. Yeah. You know, of course, you, you yeah. just have to you just have to find a way to go and do the job, and it, it's going to mean working your way up through the junior formulas and building yourself a reputation. Mm. Is there a joker in the Red Bull garage? Is Too, there one guy that stands out? Loads. Too many. Lo loads. 
loads of jokers, you know? Like everyone, everyone's got jokes when it suits them. <laughs> Man, I, we, um, Brad said it'd somehow sneak us into the Red Bull, um, what was it? Motorhome, we need to see a Red Bull garage. So you're going to have to get garage. us in there somehow. Yeah, we were saying to Brad, like we've, we've been, you know, lucky enough to get into like Williams and LP. Oh, and mate, stuff. Brad's got all the clout. Brad, Brad Has can he really? sort that out. Oh, really? Yeah. We, oh, okay. we, I just thought I'd stitch him Good up. To know. <laughs> I'll be texting him constantly. Brad, I'm here. Brad, I'm outside. We're going to be stood outside Red Bull. Like, yeah, no, we, we know Brad. Brad said he'll get us in. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's one of them things, you know, once you start spending time in the paddock and building those relationships, like there are people that I worked for right at the beginning of my career that if I phoned them up and said I was in the market for a job, they'd be there to give me a reference. They'd be there to find out what was available for me. You know, because those relationships, regardless of you moving on and moving on, you can, you know, you, you keep those relationships. They're really important in the industry. So the networking of it all is still a massive part of it. Mm. What do your parents think of what you do? <laughs> all right, so my mum, my mum, she spent, she worked her ass off when I was a kid to send me to an expensive school. <laughs> So when I turned around and told her that I was going to be a mechanic, you can imagine she wasn't <laughs> she wasn't overly enamoured with that decision. You know, I yeah. think it took her a little while to to come round to the fact that I was just going to go and get dirty and covered in grease all day. Mm. But once I'd sort of told her that I was on this pathway to being in F1, she was like amazingly supportive. Like now she's you know all mum like all mums. She's your biggest fan. Yeah, yeah. great. You know? So yeah, my dad is my dad's a funny one because my dad. Just, I think he just doesn't care about racing that much, especially when I first started. Like he was proud of, you know, he's proud of you for for doing something that you mm. love and doing mm. something amazing. But I think up until, I think last year was when he started to actually care about racing. Right. Like I think up until then he was just proud of me. That's so jokes. Nine years in the industry. Mate, well, <laughs> it's only last year. That he <laughs> well, so this is the thing. So I think like up until that point he was just you know proud of me doing something I loved, and then I think last year. I'm pretty sure he was rooting for Lewis. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm pretty sure that my dad and all my uncles, they were all rooting for Lewis all year without a shadow of a doubt. And I, I remember we being saying to them, well, why, why aren't you rooting for me? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're rooting for you, mate. But we want, I'm like, give over, man. They're trying to like, wait. Like, I've got to sit there and listen to them wait Lewis for, waiting for Lewis to win. And it's, it was nice. To, That's brutal. It was nice to shut him up. Your, your dad's an empty. MBE, right? Yes. So my dad, um, for many years, he was a firefighter. Um, then he worked for the Fire Brigades Union. He was like the first chief exec of the union for black and ethnic minority members. I think firefighter is one of the coolest jobs, by the way. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I do. Yeah, risking your life to fucking <laughs> save another cool life. That's badass. I wouldn't do it. No. I don't think I would have been allowed, to be fair. I'm pretty sure my dad told me at one point I wasn't allowed to be a firefighter <laughs> yeah. anyway. And I don't blame him. But yeah, so he did that. He was a labor counsellor. Um, for a little while and then yeah he was he was awarded an MBE for his services to uh, black and ethnic minority communities in London and his services to the fire service amazing so he's, really he's cool. left some boots to fill yeah basically. yeah I'd yeah. say you're feeling them bro like, I don't know man I keep, he keep, I keep reminding him I'm a world champion he keeps reminding me he's got an MBE when <laughs> <laughs> so they actually the night in with the sword is that yeah is yeah that I went to the whole thing <laughs> That's nice. Nice. I got That's I got nice. grief from my mum because I wore jeans to Buckingham Palace <laughs> Covered in grease. Well, yeah, I was just like, you know, they invited me. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah, I'm going to show up. I want to show up. Like, yeah. Could be lit. a double world champion in this year. Mate, that's the one. I need it's to looking like it's going I'll, very well. I just want that constructors. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. You know, for me, that's, that's the last thing on my list of things that I want to be able to say I achieved in F1. Looks like you're on the, on the way there. Mate, I, I can't. I don't think about it at all. I'm, not, I'm trying really? not to think about it at all. You know, like I said earlier, one of the biggest things about last year was the fact that you, you're thinking about the whole season. You're thinking about all these compound things that build up and build up. So I think this year, obviously you're aware of the fact that it's going well. But I think this year, for me, the important thing I've been doing is just each week at a time. You know, like right now, my only focus is getting the job done in Spa. You know, mm. and each day and each, you know, session and each nut and bolt on the car. I think if you, it's a lot easier to deal with if you just sort of say, right, this is the job this week. Wow, looking like next year's going to have 24, 25 races as well. So it's going to be- You're going to be busy. <laughs> it's only, it's only going to get bigger. Yeah, Formula One is growing so much. Yeah, it's only going to get bigger. Um, how we deal with it, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Callum, let's bring the episode to an end because we've got to get you down to the car. 
<laughs> amazing right. thank you very much for joining us mate, it's, it's amazing to get your pleasure. insight mate, it's, you a, it's an honour to have you on yeah, 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 thank yeah, you mate, for telling your you. story of how you got into motorsport I'm sure loads of people would have listened to that and absolutely loved it so mm. interesting to hear for us as well yeah thank you thank you for having me yeah those of you listening rate the podcast five stars follow if you haven't already there'll be another episode on Thursday hope you're enjoying guest month yeah Thursday's going to be a cool one yeah Thursday's going to be a cool one I think people are going to enjoy Thursday's episode they're going to enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hope so. Right, down to the car. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys later. Callum, legend. Take it easy, boys. Cheers.